Well, you may not hear it because the wind protection on that camera is pretty good, but it is blowing right now. It's probably a 30 mile per hour wind. Um, we woke up this morning at about 3 a.m. with the wind just starting to pick up and had to climb down, close the awning, and just kind of close all the compartments on the tent to stop the dust blowing in and struggled to sleep the rest of the night. So eventually just got up before sunrise, thought we'd take a walk, get some nice time lapses, and now we're busy packing up. Hopefully the wind dies down uh, when we hit the dunes and we don't get sandblasted. But that's part of the experience, I guess. You can't control the weather. And in an extreme place like Namibia, extreme things can happen. With a quick breakfast built down and our bodies plastered with sunscreen, we hop in the trucks and wave goodbye to Sosis Oasis as we make a beeline for Sosis Flay. Today is our fourth day on the road and is technically supposed to be a rest day with a comparatively short drive taking us the 100 or so kilometers into the Namib desert towards the Sosusvle where we'll enjoy some short hikes and some lunch before heading back towards Sesrim and finding camp at Oshana. It looks like a short cruise on a map but looking at the route on Gaia GPS with the surroundings in 3D shows just how insane this really is. We were about to deposit ourselves right in the middle of one of the driest and most inhospitable deserts on earth. Not far from our campsite we pass through a gate which marks the entrance to the reserve and we pay our entrance fee. As South Africans we get a special rate in all the Namibian parks. With permits sorted we head west. At first we are surrounded by rocky mountains, the odd tree and a few patches of grass but as the dunes move closer the vegetation begins to disappear. There is only one road in and out of the Sosis Flay. It starts off as a smooth tarred surface and turns into soft sand towards the end, but we were able to make ground quickly through this first portion as the dunes loom larger and larger on our right. The Namib Desert stretches over 2,000 kilometers along the Atlantic coastline and is koi koi for vast place. It isn't the largest desert on earth, but it is one of the driest. Only the Atacama Desert in Chile has aridity levels that can challenge it. It feels like I've just been plonked in the middle of a magazine cover or something. <laughs> I mean, I've seen so many pictures in getaway magazines, um, travel magazines, 4x4 magazines of, of these red dunes. Uh, but to see it with my own eyes, it's pretty surreal. We're only just really entering the the Sosus Flay the strip of, of a flat land that sort of digs deep into the Namib Desert. Um, we've, we've got quite a long way to drive still, but already we're seeing incredible sights all around us and it's only going to get better. These dunes are amongst the highest in the world with Big Daddy Dune, which we'll be visiting later on, rising to over 325 meters from base to summit. Suddenly we're surrounded by dunes on both sides and we find ourselves on a side road taking us right to the base of one of these red giants. The wind was completely relentless and every second spent outside the relative shelter of the vehicle was painful as any part of our body left exposed was sandblasted. We didn't let the conditions get the better of us though, as we jumped in the deep end, so to speak, and spent some time in the sand. This is just one of many big dunes on this route 
and one that's pretty famous is Dune 45, just a few minutes up the road. Right, this is Dune 45 up ahead, so just take the turn on the left when you get to the intersection. Guide GPS shows a hiking path up the dune, although I find it hard to understand that anyone in their right mind would actually want to put themselves through that torture. Oh my word, I'm not walking up there, I'm sorry. We have to. Nope. We do actually see people climbing Dune 45, and I can't help but wonder what kind of person would see this as a fun way to spend the day. The answer? Europeans. I just don't get it. We eventually make it to the end of the tar road and this is where the real fun begins. All two wheel drive vehicles and buses have to park off here and from here on it's 4x4 only. Our camera actually started dying on us here which gave us a bit of a scare. The exposure went haywire, the cooling fan stopped working, all from the fine dune sand which had found its way into every nook and cranny. So very very soft sand uh, here all the way to Sausage Flay. So we've gone down to like one bar on the tyres. Uh, Low range 4x4 and that should keep us gliding on top of the sand. It'll be a fun drive as well. Thankfully the camera began to work again slowly but surely over the next 24 hours as the sand began to dislodge itself. But for now Nicole found herself having to use the manual ND filter to bring the exposure down. When in Africa just find a way to make things work. So we can pause. Yeah. With the tyres aired down a bit, we're ready to tackle the soft sand and we're going to play a bit of a game for the rest of the video. Every time you see a vehicle, make a mental note of the make and model. It's always interesting to see what vehicles work well in a given area or terrain and as you'll see, everyone seems to be thinking along the same lines. We make it to the parking area and the first item on our agenda is to visit Deadflay. An iconic salt pan, just a short walk over a dune. Deadflay is one of the most visited tourist attractions in Namibia. Quite astounding when you consider how remote and inaccessible it really is. But it soon made sense. This place is incredible. The wind was still pumping pretty hard at this point, but as we made our way further into the dunes, we seemed to find some shelter and eventually we could hear ourselves speak again. Well, the wind's finally died down just enough for us to, to talk a bit <laughs> and get some audio. We're busy doing a little walk to Deadflay. It doesn't look so far on the map, but when you're walking on desert sand like this up and down dunes, it takes its toll on your calves. <laughs> it's not fun. So yeah, just one more hill, we'll get to Deadflay. Uh, be good to see that. Some of the crazier people are climbing up a dune called Big Daddy Dune, which is very high. That's not for me. I don't think that's for any of us. So we're going to give that a skip. We'll do dead flay and we'll come back and we'll do sausage flay. A writer once said that dead flay is known for two things. Haunting trees reaching out from the pale earth and pale tourists reaching for their cameras. This description turned out to be 100% accurate. What amazes me most about this area is that the dunes seem to just know their place. Sand is constantly being swept over their peaks by the strong wind, and yet they never encroach on these flays and valleys. Dead flay has been sitting in its current state for centuries, and standing here just gives you a feeling of being completely lost in time. It is believed that these trees died around 700 years ago and just cannot decompose because it's too dry. In need of water and a respite from the heat, we make our way back to the parking lot. Remember I spoke about counting the different vehicles? Well, here you go. One Amarok, the only non-Japanese vehicle here. One Isuzu, three Land Cruisers and seven Hiluxes. Oh, make that eight. Anyway, moving on. Just north of Dead Flay is a picnic spot with a bunch of trees providing shady spots to pull over for lunch. On our way to see these trees, we spot a truck full of tourists getting itself stuck. The driver didn't want to tell the tourists to get off, and the tourists didn't want to volunteer to get off, and so the wheels just spun themselves deeper into the sand. Us being the good Samaritans that we are, decided to get off and help, 
Although the truth is that I just wanted to use my recovery tracks, which I'd now carried a couple thousand kilometers on my roof. We told the tourists to get out, and in no time, the driver, who didn't seem very experienced at driving in the sand, had got himself free. We put the tracks back in their place and moved to our picnic spot. It was extremely weird for us to see this jackal come so close to us. Growing up on farms where jackals kill a lot of livestock and are basically shot on the spot, we're used to them being pretty much invisible. Out here though, they've probably come to rely on tourist leftovers for survival. I guess this explains how dogs were able to be domesticated so easily. It hasn't taken much to turn this wild animal into a pet. You'd never see the same thing with a leopard, caracal or lynx out here. Yes, please. Today for lunch we're going to be doing a Dubba classic. We're doing some chicken chicken wraps. The guys have bought a whole bunch of vegetables, which I know Matthew's going to be enjoying later. Especially and we've got tomato. some Jimmy sauce on some chicken. And yeah, we're just going to be frying this up. Everything else is fresh, throwing it in a wrap and we're going to be eating lacquer, I think. That lunch break was exactly what we needed. A perfect little spot underneath the tree and some cool animal sightings too. But with this heat, I don't think we're going to want to hang around here too long. We're going to have a quick stop at the sausage play which is sort of the main attraction here. And then we'll make our way back towards the uh, town of Cesarium and see if we can find our accommodation. So this behind us here is the Sausage Flay. Although the place where we had our lunch is technically also the Sausage Flay. Sausage Flay is just sort of the, the general area here where all this water from further up in higher altitude areas in Namibia comes underground and gets deposited here between the dunes. Um, and in very very wet seasons which maybe only happens once every like seven or ten years this place will fill up with water and all these little flat spots at the bottom of the dunes will become um, it'll almost look like a lake although in reality it's, it's very very shallow here um, we had a very wet season last year and this whole area was very green for a while there was actually grass growing on these dunes which is insane but obviously now things have come back to normal and the water starting to recede and, and dry out again. But I think we're pretty lucky to see water here. I know that it's not often uh, very wet. So we'll soak in these views. Probably not for too long because it's very hot. And I'll tell you, it's painful to look at the water and know that we can't really swim in it because it's probably this deep. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think we'll head out soon and try to find a nice place to, to cool off and maybe have a little afternoon nap. But really, really grateful to be able to come out here the, the wind has died down so we're really enjoying uh, these great conditions and we'll remember these views for the rest of our lives. The word sausus flay is of mixed origin. Sausus is a Nama word meaning no return while flay is Afrikaans for marsh. It makes sense. A river flows here and then simply evaporates. And this right here was probably one of the highlights of my day. Seeing a gemsbuck in its natural habitat on the dunes. These animals basically survive off the moisture that collects on the dunes from the cold air of the Atlantic. Amazing how well they're adapted to live in the desert. This is fun. <laughs> Most fun driving I've had for a few days. <laughs> Thank you.
Our campsite tonight is at a place called Sesrim Oshana, which is very similar to the previous night's campsite, with a very simple shade structure and ablution block. Well, we've just arrived at our campsite for tonight, um, Oshana. Looks really nice. We've got some ablution, same as last night, but it's really hot, so I think our first priority is just to pop out the awning and get some shade, and we'll take it from there. Oh. <laughs> My feet were covered with blisters from walking barefoot in the hot sand, so I decided to take it easy for the next few hours. But we heard about a place called Sesrim Canyon, and while I was resting, the rest of the guys went exploring. Sesrim Canyon is basically a big donga formed by a river that flows through here during very heavy rain and erodes the sand and rocks away. It starts off as no more than a shallow detent in the ground, but eventually drops deeper until you find yourself walking in a shaded crevice with rocky walls all around and even some trees. Looking back at this footage, I can't help but to feel that I've missed out, but I'm glad Nicole was able to capture this footage. They even saw an owl sitting in the shade. Comment down below if you know what species of owl this is. As the rest of the group made their way out of the canyon and back towards camp, I was busy charging batteries and setting up time lapses and we'd definitely chosen a good campsite with an unobstructed view of the Namib dunes to our west and the most incredible sunset about to take place with buckies kicking up dust on their return back to the gate and Gemsbuck, Springbuck and Jackals silhouetting as I walked through the frame. Just look at that. Sun has just gone down. I think it's about 6.45 p.m. And finally the temperatures come down as well. So I feel like a bit of life has just been injected in me. I think the other guys feel the same. We're gonna just start setting up around this fire here. We're probably not gonna cook on the fire tonight. And we might just get the fire going for Gies, which is, what's the translation of Gies? Just vibe, atmosphere. Um, just for the hell of it <laughs> and then we'll probably do some bacon pasta something like that tonight we just don't want to defrost meat this late in the evening and um, yeah risk that not being the way we want it so bacon pasta it is setting up camp and once again got a nice little campsite here with some ablution facilities and everything we need for some comfortable living with temperatures now very comfortable, the wind calm and the sun down, we sit and watch the orange sky darken and begin to make way for the stars once again. This would be our last night in the desert and we'd be crossing the Tropic of Capricorn tomorrow and entering a very different biome. One with a little more trees and some insane rock structures at the granite monolith Spitzkorp. Tomorrow isn't even on our minds right now though. It was all about the food. Welcome to another night of cooking in the middle of nowhere. Tonight we've got another gourmet meal coming up. We've got uh, crispy bacon sourced from another, the same shop right actually as uh, dodgy chicken. Um, we've got a salad. And then we've got some pasta going over there and then Nicole's going to hook us up with a nice creamy um, carbonara type sauce. So we're living pretty nicely out in the desert, it's not too bad. <laughs> we'd be getting quite an early night as we'd have another long slog tomorrow heading further north along the massive Namib Desert and through the coastal towns of Wolfus Bay and Swakopmund before gaining over a kilometre of altitude en route to the magnificent Spitzkopper. Subscribe to follow along on our journey and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.